Welcome to the Faith Bridge Sermon Podcast. Today we've got a terrific message from Helder Favarin on why Faith Bridge should be involved in mission efforts around the world. Make sure you join us afterwards for our podcast question time. Good morning. I was so looking forward to eating some amazing Texan barbecue. Oh, sorry, I mean, I was so looking forward, I've been so looking forward to seeing you all. <laughs> so, honestly, what, what an honor and a joy to be with you, Faith Bridge. Thank you so much, Pastor Dan, Pastor Ken, and all of you for your invitation and wonderful hospitality. I've been learning so much from, from you as I get to hear more about what God is doing in and through the life of this impressive church. I want to apologize for not having a Texan accent. Not everyone has that privilege, but at least I can say y'all. Is that right? Yeah? I was born and raised in Brazil, though I'm also Italian by nationality, but I lived all my teenage years in Mexico. Uh, my wife and I got married almost 13 years ago. We were ready to move as missionaries to the UK when my father-in-law passed away because of a cancer. We went to England around 11 years ago, and uh, we spent over two years serving in England. I was finishing my master's degree in Scotland when I had a cancer. We then moved to Spain eight years ago to serve as missionaries, and... Uh, now I'm actually doing some doctoral studies uh, here in the US, in California. And once again, I want to apologize. I know it's not as Texas. <laughs> but that's the reason why I have this funny accent. And uh, by the way, now that I mentioned California, just uh, so you know, we've been praying for you as a country as we watch the tra tragic news about the wildfires in California. And uh, we are so, so sorry. And uh, we are also very sorry for what you experienced here with Hurricane Harvey. And uh, yet, thank you very much for teaching so many of us around the world remarkable lessons on solidarity and cooperation. My family, family and I live in Granada, southern Spain, just here across the Atlantic Ocean, as you can see on the map. <laughs> it was the last region of southern Europe dominated by the Arabic Empire centuries ago. You are more than welcome to come and visit us, though not everyone at the same time, please. <laughs> and that's where our four children were born. And I think I have a picture of them for you to meet. We had Mateo, who is six, Raffaello, who is four, and we were eager to have a girl. She did come, but brought, brought a brother along. <laughs> so we have twins. And they are all praying for you and send their greetings. Well, technically not the twins, they don't yet speak. <laughs> Our home church, the church we planted, also sent you many prayers and greetings. It is called C29 Granada, and actually this is especially for you. Please watch it. Hola, Faith Rich. Hola, amigo. Hola. Hola. Good. <laughs> we planted C29 Granada almost five years ago. Um, our dream and desire was to contribute to what God was already doing through the other few and small Protestant churches. Being particularly intentional in connecting with non-Christians and mainly university students and young people in general. The University of Granada has over 60,000 students. Less than 100 are Protestants and are a part of a local church. It is one of the European universities receiving the highest number of exchange students, mainly from other European countries. This is the sort of need that moved Anna, my wife and I, to become missionaries in Europe. Now, Europe, with approximately 700 million people, has the lowest Protestant percentage of any continent and the highest percentage of atheists and agnostics. 
Europe has around 20 countries with less than 1% of Protestants. Europe is today the continent where the Christian church grows the least. And in some countries like Sweden, the church even shrinks. Over the last century, and sadly continues in our days, Western Europe experienced the greatest decline in the number of Christians ever registered in history in any given region of the world. This is even more challenging among the young people of Europe. That is the specific demographic where we find the highest number of atheism in the whole world. 55% of the young people in Spain identi identify themselves with no religion whatsoever. In the Czech Republic, it reached 91%. We have hundreds of towns in Spain with thousands of residents with not a single Protestant church. In various parts of Europe, as in the case of Spain, many see us Protestants as a cult or a sect, if they even know who we are. I was taking our children to school the other day when our four-year-old looks at me rather impatient and asks, Dad, what do you do? I didn't see that one coming, <laughs> particularly so early in the morning, and I responded amongst other things. Well, son, as you know, Dad is a pastor. Now, in Spanish, the word for pastor and shepherd is the same. So he looks at me actually irritated and says, well, but nobody understands that. Do you look after sheep? <laughs> and he was only echoing the culture's understanding. But I've not come to share with you only about Europe. Pastor Dan specifically asked me to answer this question. Why should we get involved in global mission? And he told me he would not take me out for a true Mexican barbecue unless I answer that question. <laughs> Why should you, Faith Bridge, cooperate with what God is doing beyond the borders of your country? And I don't mean Texas. Uh, <laughs> I mean the United States. And before trying to give a biblical answer to this vital question, let me just say, this is for every one of us. Global mission is not only for missionaries. Every Christian is a person on a mission. Y'all, is that right? Y'all are part of God's mission. Students, lawyers, athletes, musicians, cleaners, teachers, business people, young people, moms, dads, grandparents, all of us. And can I open my heart with you and honestly say, I'm joining you this morning with huge expectations. And I think they come from the Lord. We are praying and anticipating that this gathering will be life-changing for some of us. I honestly believe that groups of people in other parts of the world will be deeply impacted through what God is doing this morning in the lives of many of us and by how we are going to respond to his voice. I've been learning this weekend so much from what you as a church are already doing in Global Mission. And I applaud all your efforts. But I want to join in the beautiful challenge that the leadership of this church is bringing these weeks as we consider moving above and beyond. beyond. Now, Paul, as many of you would know, was a key Christian leader in the first century. He started several churches outside Israel, his own country. One of those churches was in Corinth, south of Greece. In the Bible, we find two letters that Paul later wrote to this church. In the amazing text we are about to read, Paul is making a defense of his work against unfair criticism he had received. And in this defense, he also reveals at least three reasons why he was involved in global mission. Let's look at them and, and see why you and I should also be. Please come with me to 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5. If you need a Bible, please raise your hand. We will read from verse 11 until chapter 6, verse 2. 2 Corinthians 5, from verse 11.
Since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade others. We are in, what we are is plain to God, and I hope it is plain to you. It is also plain to your conscience. We are not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than in what is in the heart. If we are out of our mind, as some say, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all. That those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. And all this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be seen for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And as God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain, for he says, in the time of my favor, I hurt you. In the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. The first reason I want to highlight as to why we should get involved in global mission is found in verse 15. It is because as followers of Christ, as Paul says, we live for him and not for ourselves. In other words, we obey Christ. Verse 11, he said, since then we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade others. Now, friends, to take the good news of the life and the message of Jesus outside the United States is not a fancy idea that the leadership of, of, of Faith Bridge are having or are a good plan for those who like to travel. It is God's command. Jesus said in Acts 1.8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all of Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That would mean to us Houston, Texas, other states, and internationally. Jesus is not saying here or there. He's not saying here and later there. He is saying here and there at the same time. The mission of the church is global. It is local and global at the same time. Jesus also said in Matthew 28, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. And we may think, whoa, Jesus was surely innovative in, in taking the geography of God's action to a global level. No, he wasn't. It had been his way of acting, God's plan from the beginning of history and the Bible records it. Please follow along with me. Are you still here? In Genesis 
The first book of the Bible, chapter 1, after creating the first men and women, God tells them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth. After the flood, Genesis 9, 1, we read, then God blessed Noah and his sons, saying to them, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth earth. In Genesis 11, humanity full of pride says, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. God comes down to see them. And as a, as a consequence, the Bible says twice, God is scattered, dispersed them from, the, from there over all the earth. Genesis 12, 3, God calls Abraham and makes the well-known promise, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Exodus 9, 16, God to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, but I have raised you up for this very purpose, that I might show you my power and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. 1 Chronicles 16, 23, sing to the Lord, all the earth. Psalm 33, 8. Let all the earth feel the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. Isaiah 52, 10. All the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. Ezekiel 39, 21. I will display my glory among the nations. Zephaniah 2, 11. The nations on every shore will worship him. Matthew 24, 14, Jesus says, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. In Acts 2, a reversal of the Babel Tower curse. The Spirit of God is poured out on people from different nations who will then be scattered and share the wonders of God with their people. Peter quotes the prophet Joel and says, In the last day, God says, I will pour out my Spirit on all people. Second Peter 3, 9, God is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. And then finally, we could mention all the books, but we don't have time for that. Finally, Revelation 7, 9. John writes, after this I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb that is Jesus. From Genesis to Revelation, from the beginning to the end of history, we find a God on a mission reaching out globally, making his holy name known throughout the earth, saving and forming a people, a family, the church of God from all the nations. Paul understood the global reality of God's mission. Did you notice how many times he uses the comprehensive terms to refer to who God is saying, saving? We read in verse 14, one died for all, and therefore all died. Verse 15, and he died for all. Verse 19, God was reconciling the world to himself. As John Stott has written, we must be global Christians with a global mission because our God is a global God. Did you notice how many times Paul mentions God or Christ in the text we've just read? Around 25 times. It's actually and primarily God's mission. As the Irish theologian Chris Wright would say, mission is all that God is doing in his great purpose for the whole of creation and all that he calls us, his church, to do in cooperation with that purpose. I would say missions include the centrality of evangelism, the proclamation of the good news of Jesus, and also the many other ways we express our love for others and trying to bring transformation to our world. 
praying for others, feeding the hungry, freeing the slaves of today's world, creating beauty and renewal in our culture, using our studies and jobs to make an impact, protecting the most fragile in society, and the list goes on. We should do it locally, and we must. Not that we could, we must do it globally. We respond in obedience to God giving, to God giving responsibility, which rests in our hands. Verse 18 of the passage we've read, Paul says, God gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Verse 19, he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Verse 20, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you, Spring, Houston, United States, world, on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. And 6-1, as God's co-workers, we urge you. So first, we participate in God's mission, global mission, because we obey Christ. The second reason I want to highlight is found in the second part of verse 14, where Paul says, because we are convinced, the word can also be translated, we con we've concluded or judged that one, one died for all. As we can clearly see, Paul strongly believed the truth about Jesus Christ, and therefore he engaged in global missions. In uh, 2016, the Oxford Dictionaries selected post-truth as its international word of the year. It surely describes the climate of our culture. Emotions and personal feelings speak higher and louder than facts. It's not really important whether things are okay. What really matters is that others would see and like my social media posts and think that I'm great. Truth is relative. What might be true for you is not necessarily true for somebody else. Many think today, including Christians. I would dare to say that one of the key reasons why many of us are not involved in the mission of God, either locally and even less internationally, is that honestly, we do not truly and entirely believe what Jesus said. I am the way, the truth, and the life. It's important to me, but maybe not necessary for others. That was clearly not the, not the case with Paul. He understood that our faith in Christ is rooted in historical facts. The climax of God's redemptive and missionary work was the cross of Jesus. Verse 19. God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. Paul was convinced that through the life, death, and the resurrection of Jesus, something historical, revolutionary, of cosmic dimension happened, is happening, and will happen. That is why Paul could burst into excitement and affirm in verse 17, if anyone is in Christ, he uses the expression in Christ 164 times in his letters. If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. And in 6.2, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. Why did Paul engage in global mission? because he believed in who Jesus was and what he had done for the whole world. Now, our convictions will always move us to action. Is that not true? What are our deep convictions? The most influential Scottish preacher of the last century, James Stewart, rightly observed, a Christian who is taking his faith seriously cannot but 
evangelize? Could it be that this morning some of us need to confess and repent from our post-truth Christianity and ask God to make our convictions in him is stronger than ever before. What would happen in our homes, places of work, gym, schools, spring, Texas, US world, if we truly believed in who Jesus is and what he has done? Jen Hus, the most influential leader of the Protestant Reformation in the Czech Republic, who, by the way, was born at stake for being considered a heretic, said, seek the truth, listen to the truth, teach the truth, love the truth, abide by the truth, and defend the truth unto death. Why then should we participate in global mission? First, because we obey him. Secondly, because we believe in him. And finally, the third reason, and they are not in order of importance, is found in verse four, 14, sorry. For Christ's love compels us. Paul reminds us that once we are affected by the love of Christ, we can't but take his love to the whole world. Now, we are not who we say we are. We are not who others say we are. We are who God says we are. And God says we are his beloved. As Philip Yancey has written, there is nothing we can do to make God love us more. And there is nothing we can do to make God love us less. No amount of racism or pride, pornography, adultery, or even murder. Grace means that God already loves us as much as an infinite God can possibly love. It reminds me of an occasion after preaching at a youth conference, I was praying and something happened to me that had never happened before and has never happened since. While praying, I had an image in my mind of a girl sitting on a closed toilet seat with her arms open and I could see several cuts in her arm. And the impression I got was this, as if God was saying, I love this girl, she tried to commit suicide, but I've stopped at her because I have a plan for her life. Let her know. But you know those moments when you don't know if it is God or not? So I said, I believe God is saying this. If you are here, please come talk to me. I went down the stage. A group of girls came and kind of left one of them with me. I don't think she could talk for around 12, two or three minutes. She was just shaking. We finally sat down. She uh, got her sleeves up and showed me her arms cut. And she said to me, I am that girl. I've been cutting myself and one day I was about to do it uh, completely and, 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 and commit suicide. I was about to do it when I heard a voice saying, don't do it. I didn't know if that was God, but I said to him, God, if this is you, now that I'm going to this conference, please confirm it to me. And this is what happened. Because Jesus said in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. As John wrote in 1 John 4, 19, we love because he first loved us. We, when, when, when we are filled with this unconditional love of Christ, we then experience an overflow of that love towards God and others. Is that not true? And we can't but take the love of God to the whole world that has already been loved by its creator. How many people are there in the world today? More than seven billion. One third of the whole world call themselves Christians. More than two billion have never heard of Jesus. When the Bible talks about nations, as we've seen before, it generally uses the Greek term ethne, meaning ethnic group. A nation or a country can have a number of ethnic uh, or people groups. 
There are almost 17,000 people groups in the world. There are around 650 with significant population who have not been reached with the gospel at all. 4,400 languages are without Bible portions available. Translation projects are in progress in an estimated of 1,600 languages. There are about 2,500 languages needing Bible translation work to begin. There are an estimated 40 million people in modern slavery around the world. 10 million are children. There are more people in slavery today than at any time in human history. Around 400 people die each day because of their Christian faith. One in seven people do not have access to drinking water in the world today. 20,000 die of hunger each day. Around 10,000 are children. For the love of Christ compels us to go above and beyond, to do more about these needs. How can we use our time, our prayers, our money, our work, our studies, our relationships, our influence to make a global impact for the kingdom of God? How can you and I participate in God's global mission? Can I suggest two great tools to help us increase our prayers, our awareness, and our focus in global mission? There's a common Spanish saying that goes like, ojos que no ven, corazón que no siente. Eyes that don't see, heart that doesn't feel. There is one app by Operation Mobilization and another one from Unreached People Groups that I would suggest you downloading so that we can pray every day for a country of the world and an Unreached People Group. I do that with our kids back home. Try to read or watch the news in prayer, please. Try to often read the international section of the newspaper. We could all pray for global mission. We could all give to global mission. We could all affect global mission through social media and technology. And some of us will literally go to global mission and serve through different vocations. The needs are gigantic. Yeah, the days we live are unprecedented in opportunities. The communication and technological revolution we are experiencing today, particularly through social media, are giving us the opportunity to take the message of reconciliation to, every, to very closed and difficult places. Our days seem uh, the most extensive and tragic refugee crisis in history. Millions have left their countries, yet now, are now living in countries where they can hear the message of God's reconciliation. Thousands of refugees around the world are turning to Christ. The church has never grown so much or been so extended around the globe as in our days. I was reading the Houston Chronicle online, recently said, officially, an atheist nation and a place where the government shutters some Christian churches. China is on course to become home to more Christians than any country in the world by 2030. Friends, Faith Bridge, because we obey him, because we believe in him, because we are loved by him, we go above and beyond in global mission. And Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. We move together cooperating in God's global mission and anticipating the climax of history when Paul's word will become a reality. When saying, God exalted him, Jesus, to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. As, and as the passage we read concludes, and I'll read it again, now is the time of God's favor. Now 
is the day of salvation. Now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. Let's go above and beyond to the whole world for his glory. Let me pray with you. Let's take a moment to talk to God. Maybe some of us, for the first time, will talk to God and say, I want to respond to your love. I've been convicted by this truth. And I want to trust that Jesus is Savior and Lord. I want to give you my life and become a part of your mission. Do it right now. And others of us who are followers of Jesus may respond to him, acknowledging that we can't not do anything without his help. And we will pray, oh Lord, move us above and beyond because we want to obey you, because we believe in who Jesus is and what he has done. And because Christ's love compels us. Help us, we pray, O oh Lord. We praise you. We love you. We need you. And we say once again, here we are. Open our eyes, hearts, minds, hands, time, influence, jobs, dreams, and use us to cooperate with what you are doing in the world. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, that was a great word for us. Helder and I only got to meet last night. We had dinner together. Dan uh, organized that. Dan has been telling me about Helder for some months and said, you're going to love his passion. He is your kind of leader, kid, <laughs> and you're going to love him. And uh, I could tell it last night, even when we were having supper together, he didn't tell you some interesting things about him that he met his wife when he was nine and they loved each other all the way through and <laughs> then had those four beautiful children. Yeah. And he is not only an academic, but he's an evangelist. You can tell he's an evangelist going around the world and preaching. And he's a church planter, which of course I have a special place in my heart for. C29 Granada That's right, is the church plant. Yes. One of the fastest growing new churches in Spain. And you can see why. Um, and there's only 1% of Christians th yes. there. And so that is, that's a hard place to, uh, to be getting it going. True. Talk True. about what has been a surprise that you have met along the way in starting the new church. Well, Ken, thank you. I would say just the level of secularism and indifference to religion is amazing. And also the, the, the amount of ignorance, hmm. if I can say like that, towards the gospel is amazing. They just don't know it. Exactly. Some people have not re rejected it. They simply have never heard the good news of Jesus. They've never been a part of a vibrant community of Christians. They simply don't know about it. Yeah. So we've been surprised at the same time to see the amount of young people and young adults who hearing about the life and the message of Jesus, getting connected to a Christian community, are opening up. Yeah. And th that is a, a thrill. 
That is. Biggest challenges of starting a new church in Granada, Spain. Well, I would highlight, as you were saying, the church is so small, everything is so slow mm. and takes time. Mm -hmm. We planted C29 Granada around five years ago, mm -hmm. and um, we are grateful to what we see are seeing God doing, mm -hmm. yet at the same time as I was saying that secularism, atheism is, is, is huge and it is, it is very difficult and people have generally, uh, as we we'll say, ignorance, but just a sense of these guys are a cult. Yeah, you're or, the... You're uh, strange people until they know you and, and, and get in contact with you. That, yeah. that, that is a big challenge yeah. I would highlight. And also, if I can be honest, um, our average people at the church at the moment are 26, 27 year old. Young. Young, exactly. We have many young adults as well, many children being born, and that is special. Mm -hmm. We've set the example on that, by the way. <laughs> yes, you have. <laughs> but Ken, now around 20% of the Spanish population are unemployed. And that goes what up- percent? In the whole of Spain, 20%. 20%. And when we talk about young people, that goes up to 50 percent. Five O. Five O are unemployed. Unemployment. So I'll be very open with you. Our monthly income is about $2,300. $2,300 a month is our total income yeah. as a church. Now my wife and I are missionaries, so we raise our support. Yes, we do. cannot have staff or have a salary. And, uh, and we give out 20% of our income wow. to missions and to people outside. That's our vision. But I have to be honest with you, sometimes we become frustrated because we would love to do more and see more, sure. but there isn't more. For instance, we, we meet up on Sundays on an art and school place that we rent for a few hours, uh -huh. and we are now paying something like uh, 1,200 euros or dollars a month. Uh -huh. We strongly think that we should rent a place where we can be every day, right at the city center by the university campus and become something else, a bridge to our city. Sure. That would be something fantastic. Yeah. And now, a place like that would cost us 1,600 a month, $1,700 a month. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's of course a major step uh, for an economy like ours. So we have the dreams, we see the possibilities. Sure. But I, I'm being very honest with you, Good. we see that the economical challenge is mainly working with that sort of demographic well, in Europe today. We're going to see if we can't help you make that happen. Give him a hand, and I want to talk to you, you. you going back. Thanks. All right, so here's, here's where we are. You know we're in this above and beyond push. These are offerings above and beyond the normal, and we're doing great on our $500,000 goal. Um, right now, we have uh, three, we have raised three fifths of it, 60% of it has come in. You're being so generous, as always, when we have a push, uh, typically in the fall for missions. And I just want to say thank you for that. Ben Stewart called and said, How is it coming? And I said, Oh, it's coming. Uh, we've still got another uh, week or so, so you just be in prayer. Now, let me tell you what we're going to do. Um, we need to close this gap of 200,000 today. And that's very doable in our uh, church. We don't have the uphill climbs, uh, certainly not that Helder has described uh, here. So here's um, what else I know. He was telling you some numbers and it, the, the scale is so different to DC, it's different to Houston. Uh, so just for $1,700 a month, they could get in this new venue, uh, the big theater near the university, $1,700 a month for a whole year worth of Sundays. And he told me this at dinner, he didn't say this, but I said, well, what do you have to do to transform it and to get the, the AV and all of that? He said, it'd be about $30,000. Well, you add that up, that's about $50,000. And so last night I was talking with Dan and I said, well, Dan, why don't we just do the $50,000 and get him in there? Because this young man has God's blessing and we can do this. And he said, well, I just wanted you to kind of figure it out yourself. That's why I wanted you to <laughs> have dinner. And, um, and so now in addition to 
this, of course, we have uh, my father's house that you saw the fantastic video of. Um, and, uh, and then there's Hope for Honduras that we're supporting. We've got a lot of things already happening internationally as well as the DC, as well as the local. And so here's, here's how I want to help frame this, this last little push for us, all right? Because many of you have given, and I say thank you for your generosity. Many of you sort of hung, hanging back. I know how it works. You're like, I kind of want to wait and kind of see what, what's shaping up. So let me just do a little, uh, a little matrix for you that Sully, our business administrator, showed me on Friday. If we had 250 people today who said, I would do $50, that would be a stretch for you, but it would be above and beyond, praise the Lord. If we had 150 who would say, I will do $250 today. And if you added to that 100 who would say, we're gonna do $500, we can do 500. And if you added to that, uh, 50 who said, we're in for a thousand. We can do a thousand dollars for this above and beyond, for all of these good things that God is doing around the world. And if we had 10 of you who would say, uh, we can do 5,000. If we did that, bam, all of it is closed and we're there. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pray and I'm gonna ask you uh, to Listen to the Lord and let him just put a number on your heart. You say, practically, how do I do it? If you've missed the last two weeks, uh, we've got two envelopes. We've got the regular, this is just your regular offering uh, envelope. And, but this is the above and beyond. These are the numbers that I'm talking about right here. And if you didn't get a little handout when you came in, the bulletin and the envelopes, you can flag one of the ushers right now. They're in the aisles and they'll be glad to let you know. If you don't use paper anymore, you don't write checks or cash or anything, you just go to the app, FaithBridge app, or go online, faithbridge.org uh, and uh, slash uh, giving, or rather slash beyond. And you can just do the little slider down and uh, drop down to that, and then the accountants here will know what portion of your offering uh, is going to above and beyond and what portion is the normal offering. And so uh, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna pray, and then I'm gonna ask you to stay uh, a minute more. We're gonna do one more song, and then I wanna give you a Thanksgiving blessing before you go. If you are uh, wearing one of the gray shirts and you need to slip out, during the song, after the offering to get to your post to serve, uh, you, you, you slip out subtly. But otherwise, I'll ask us to, to make this a holy moment and let's stay. Let's pray. Lord, you have indeed given us so much. We have heard Helder uh, today and just hearing what he talks about has brought to mind so clearly once again how much you have given us. I think of the expression that I heard somewhere along the way in missions, there's at least three kinds of people. They're the people who are the prayers, they're praying for them. And they're the goers, those are the people who are going. And Lord, you're building our going population. And then there's givers. Some of us are all three, but today, Lord, I'm, I'm really praying for the giver portion. You've given to us so much in this uh, part of the world. Won't you help us to be generous that more can hear the good news of Jesus and be reached with his hope. Use these offerings now, I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hi, I'm Dan Slagle, and welcome to Postscript. Today, we are with Helder Favarin, our guest from Granada, Spain, who brought us a terrific message to wrap up our Above and Beyond series. His message focused on the question, why should FaithBridge be involved in world mission? Helder, welcome to FaithBridge. Thank you very much. Oh, it was a terrific word, really uh, important word for our congregation to hear. Some good questions came in. Mm -hmm. um, 
You mentioned during the course of your message a couple of resources that folks could tap into apps yeah. uh, in order to pray. Beyond giving uh, and other forms of support, I think these would be two excellent tools that people could use just to stay in touch with what's happening around the world. Could you tell us a little bit more about those two apps? Sure. One of them is Operation World okay. app. And they have, for every day of the year, one nation to pray about with several statistics and challenges. Okay. The other one is called Unreached People's Group. And you can look it up with that name. Unreached it, People Groups. Exactly. Okay. And we'll have not a nation, but a specific people group I see. for us to pray about yeah. with challenges and statistics as well. So okay. a great way to be aware of and to be praying for a global mission. Good. Yeah. Good. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Uh, another question came in had to do with uh, a sense of call that mm -hmm. some people are feeling. I, I actually ha just had a conversation with a young lady out in the atrium who uh, is sensing a call to mission herself. Right. This individual that wrote in asked a very important question about how do we determine if God really is calling us to go somewhere or if he's calling us just to focus on what we're doing right here and now. I wonder if maybe you could share out of yours and uh, Anna's experience yeah. about how you all concluded whether to go or to stay. Yeah, that's a very important uh, topic to talk about, yeah. very broad. Um, I would highlight a couple of things, okay. first of all, then. I think it's important to understand from a biblical perspective that in a way all Christians have been called by God, sure. first of all, to salvation to himself and called to the mission of God. Okay. God is on a mission and he's calling all of us anywhere we are to be involved in that mission. Right. So the geography, I think, is secondary. Okay, good. But it is important. And for some of us, I believe primarily for uh, because of the work of the Spirit mm -hmm. within us, he will impress in us, not for a week, not for months, maybe for a long period of time, a need of going somewhere. Mm -hmm. And I would encourage us who may be sensing that geographical reorientation to talk to others, leaders, pastors, and allow time to confirm that impression from the Spirit. Good. He said to all of us, go. Mm -hmm. But some of us will specifically tell us where. That has been the case for my wife and I, okay. as we left Brazil, sensing a redirection to Europe. Uh -huh. Though first of all, we thought we would be going back to Brazil after a couple of years. But being there, and this is, I think is important, there was a combination of an inner sense of, this is what we have to do. I see. And an intersection of the needs that okay. we saw. We sense it and we see the needs and therefore we conclude that God might be sending us to be part of the uh, solution to a need, right. to place it like that. Yeah. And that's how things uh, happened with us and we ended up staying in Europe and moving from the, U the UK to Spain okay. in Southern Europe. Okay. Yeah. So it's really not just one question, there are actually several factors someone needs to consider as they pray about these things, think about these things. Absolutely. And something that I always encourage people who share a similar situation with me is, yes, yeah, spend time seeking, praying, and hearing the Lord. Mm -hmm. Secondly, talk to more experienced leaders, yeah. your pastors, and people's, people around you mm -hmm. to get their feedback and impressions. But also, talk to the people who are where you would like to go, oh, or who are yeah. doing what you would like to be doing. Yeah. Who are these people? Write to them, meet with them, do a visit and go see it by yourself. Sure. And I've seen God using all those relationships and, and impressions and combine in a way, gives us uh, little by little the, the pieces of the puzzle. As I often think God doesn't reveal the whole picture, yeah. but he will give the right piece at the right time to form a picture that enables us to take the next step towards going where he wants us to be. That's really yeah. good, good yeah. good advice, good word. Uh, finally, tell us a little bit about your vision for C29. Where, where do you hope to see the church going in the next year, five years, and so forth? Great. One of the things we are committed and passionate about, and we believe is a biblical understanding, is to help 
primarily young adults, mm -hmm. students and young adults in Spain, to understand that God is calling them to be part of His mission. And what we want to see happening is that our students, our professionals, would see and recognize the fact that God is sending them to the different places of work, leisure, relationships, to be part of God's mission okay. where they are. And we think that is crucial. And as a church, mm -hmm. we would love to see our people understand that we are a church when we are gathered and we are a church when we are dispersed. And if we want to make an impact in the Spanish society, mm -hmm. we must, each one of us, recognize our place in God's mission on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and really reach what is a uh, gathered church we cannot reach uh, being of a, such a small proportion of the church within the, the whole of the country. Hmm. Yeah, That's exciting. Yes, yeah. indeed. Yes, we're grateful for what God is doing and, uh, and yeah, looking forward to what is next. Sure. Well, yes. We're grateful that you could be with us today. It was Thank a great so message. I'm really excited about Faith Bridge involvement in missions as a result of your time yeah. here with us. So thank you. It's been my privilege. Thank you so much, Dan, you and bet. the whole Faith Bridge family. Absolutely. Thank you for joining us for Postscript, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.